Good morning, everyone. My name is Nate Jordan. I'm in the 10th grade, and I serve in the children's ministry here at Cross. Uh, I'm going to be reading from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had begun to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you to Nate. I'm really grateful to have young, faithful men who would uh, risk coming up here to read the scriptures for us. We're really grateful. Uh, we, we have a great student ministry, a lot of uh, g godly young men and women, and uh, thankful that they can participate in our worship services. Uh, today, what I want to do is talk to you about uh, confidence, and more specifically, confidence in the midst of your circumstances. Like, I don't know the specific story, you know many of you, and what's going on in your life, the things that are happening, uh, but I, I couldn't give you all the details of your circumstances. So some of you are here and you're afraid. Uh, of what, what is ahead, what's to come. Uh, maybe something has, you know, uh, entered into your life and it's kind of upset the balance and you're not sure what the outcome is going to be. Uh, for others of you, uh, there's just uncertainty or maybe there's a very particular difficulty. You know what the struggle is. And as you think about your life, uh, it's just really hard for you to have confidence about what's ultimately coming. Now, uh, today we're going to look into the New Testament book of Acts. And we're going to see that Peter, the Apostle Peter and John, uh, they maintain confidence in the midst of some fairly difficult circumstances. They, they maintain that. And listen, that is a testimony, by the way, to the rest of the world around us. When we as believers uh, maintain our confidence, we can remain hopeful, we can have joy in the midst of difficulty, it's a testimony to the world around us. Uh, one of my favorite stories uh, about John Wesley in particular, if you don't know who John Wesley is, he's kind of the father of Methodism, the Methodist church and all that. That kind of comes from Wesley, but in the 1700s, he was uh, an English priest. Uh, he had been trained at Oxford. He hung out with an evangelist by the name of George Whitfield. If you've heard about a lot of the revivals that took place back in the 1700s, George Whitfield was like a fireball. He was a preacher, a big tent revival type sort of thing going on. And John Wesley was a, a friend of his. They would meet at the Holy Men's Club there at Oxford. And Wesley, on one of his trips, it was actually a missionary trip to the Americas, uh, is sailing on a ship and they hit uh, a, what must have been an overwhelming storm. Um, not only are the waves breaking over the bow of the ship, uh, the, the sail itself, the main sail was shredded just by the force of the winds. As they think about their outcome, it's likely the ship is going to sink. Uh, this will be the end for each of them. And through the roar of the storm and the waves and the wind and all the things that are going on, I, he hears singing, and he's drawn to the singing. And so he, he goes over, and he finds this group of German Christians known as the Moravians, and they're singing the Psalms. And he talks about seeing the confidence that they had and, like, this contentment and this joy that they could have in the midst of the storm that could cost them their life. And it kind of kind of stuck with him. It bothered him. They did make it to the Americas. He did a couple of years of, of his work as a missionary here in the United States. He goes back to England, and a couple of years later, he ends up getting saved 
as a result. But one of the things that God used in his life was the confidence of these German Christians in the midst of what was probably a life-threatening storm. And he couldn't figure out how they could be so confident. How could they have such joy? How could they have such boldness when their lives could be ending? They were going to see a similar account in Acts chapter 4. Uh, if you know the story of what's happened thus far in Acts, we have some pretty big miracles that have already happened. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. People are speaking in languages that they don't know, uh, declaring the mighty deeds of God, and everyone's hearing in their own language. And so people thought they were either drunk or something's happening, but everyone recognized that this was out of the ordinary. The people were amazed at the Spirit of God on this day. If you were here last week, uh, there was a man who had been lame, since birth. He's over 40 years old, and the people in Jerusalem are stirred up because as Peter and John came by and said, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk, this man didn't just get up and walk, but he was running and leaping, and he was praising God. And so everyone, once again, is amazed. And you just think, and if I'm writing this story, and if I'm writing this story of the book of Acts, man, people are getting saved, people are getting healed, people, I mean, just miraculous things are happening, and it's just going to continue on forever, and it's going to be amazing, but that is not how it happened. Church, Jesus has called us to be disciples in the midst of the real world, not in the midst of a fake or pretend world where everything is always perfect and life is always easy. Instead, we as believers, we live out our faith in the midst of a fallen and broken world where there's hardship and there's difficulty and there's sickness and there's loss. And so I want you to see the response of Peter and John. Um, the first thing here in verse 4, it says, as they were speaking to the people, they just healed this man. He's out leaping, praising God in the temple. They're sharing the gospel uh, with everyone who will hear, who's amazed at what's happened. And as they're speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple, temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them. This isn't a friendly visit. And being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead, they laid hands on them and they put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. And everything was rocking along just fine. 3,000 people saved on Pentecost, more out of their number every single day. And then Peter and John got put in jail for what they were preaching. And you would think that people would be afraid to follow Christ at this point. You would think, uh, oh, I'm going to think twice about, you know, diving off into that. And yet, if you read verse 4 here, you see what happens when the gospel is pressed, when the church of Jesus Christ faces opposition. What it happened here, and it's happened all throughout church history, this pattern has continued, that when the church is persecuted or oppressed or faces difficulty... It explodes. The gospel goes forth. Verse 4, it says, Many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. So a couple of thousand more people have been added to this brand new church that was formed on the day of Pentecost as people professed faith in Jesus Christ, repented of their sins. That, like There is this extraordinary thing happening, but we can't forget. Now, that night as they're celebrating and people are being baptized and, you know, high-fiving one another, they've come to faith in Christ. Peter and John, they spend the night in prison. And don't miss the weight of these circumstances. In verse 5, it says, On the next day, the rulers and the elders and the scribes, they were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, was there. And Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of high priestly descent. Listen, the most important, the most powerful people in the most important and powerful city in kind of all of Judaism are gathered together on this day. Now, we don't necessarily recognize all of these names, uh, all of them of high priestly descent. Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And if you're not familiar with, with Caiaphas, remember that when Jesus got arrested, they brought him to the house of Caiaphas. This is the high priest. It was in his home where they spat in Jesus' face. It was in the home of Caiaphas where they beat Jesus with their fists, where they mocked him. It was Caiaphas and these same chief priests and rulers and elders who handed Jesus over to Pilate to be crucified. And they come and get Peter and John in the morning. And they bring them and they sit them before these very same people who had just had Jesus crucified. And Peter and John don't know the outcome. 
They don't know what's next. So the high priest, they ask him a question in verse 7. It says, when they placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? They're talking about a man who was lame from birth who's now walking. They were amazed by the miracle. They want to know, they want Peter and John to answer the question, by what power or in what name are you doing this? And yet, they're not really asking them a question. If you skip back up to verse 2, they knew the answer to the question, and that's why they got disturbed. That's why they were upset and arrested in the first place. In verse 2, it says, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead, that's why they chose to arrest them. So in asking this question... Maybe it was like a formal inquiry. We need these guys to state exactly uh, what they believe. But more likely, these elders, these chief priests, these rulers, they were trying to intimidate Peter and John. They wanted them to be quiet. They wanted them to be afraid. And maybe they thought, hey, these guys will kind of back off a little bit, say we're not sure, maybe it was just God. Maybe they'll be kind of generalize what happened here, but that, that's not what Peter and John did. In verse 8 it says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to him, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel. Hey guys, um, we don't just want to say in this room, I'm going to answer this question for you by what name and by what power this man was made well. Let it be made known to every ruler in all of Jerusalem, all of the people uh, uh, that are here, all of you who are in power. And also, we're not going to stop here. We want this to be known throughout all of the nation of Israel. Let it be known to you in all of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, By this name, this man stands here before you in good health. So Peter and John didn't pull any punches. And they wouldn't have known the outcome. They wouldn't have known, was it imprisonment? Was it beatings? Was it suffering? Like, what would ultimately come as a result of them answering full on here? You know, just kind of laying it out there for them. They didn't even hold back the line of Jesus being resurrected from the dead, which is really the reason that the Sadducees were riled up in the first place. You see, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. And so not only did they declare in Jesus' name that these miracles had happened, they also declared Jesus has risen. There is a profound boldness here. In the midst of men who could punish them, harm them, perhaps even put them to death, Peter declares boldly uh, what has just happened. In verse 11, he says, He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. He's quoting Psalm 118. He's like, remember the psalmist? Remember the prophecy about the Messiah? And that was Jesus. He was the one whom you rejected. He's the chief cornerstone. Jesus is the one, the cornerstone, the stone on which every other thing is built. It's the one by which every other stone is ultimately said to be right and true and in the right place, right? Jesus is the center of Christianity. Jesus is the center of our relationship with God. Jesus is the one we're supposed to focus on. And then he says in verse 12, now, let's, let's be honest. This was a claim that that would have been controversial back then, just like it is today. I mean, if you were to make this claim publicly, go on television or the radio, this would be really hard for people to hear. Matter of fact, you would have people argue with you, call you lots of names, right, for even making this claim. He says, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. In our culture, someone's going to respond back to you on Facebook. You might get tweeted at. I mean, things might might happen, but for Peter to make this claim, it could have cost him his life. So significant was his response, the response of Peter and John, that it even caught the chief priests and the rulers off guard. Verse 13, it says, As they observed the the, the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, They were amazed. It's the third and final time we'll see this word used in this way in Acts. First, we saw the people amazed at Pentecost. Then we saw the people amazed that a man who was 40 years old, who'd never walked, was walking. And now they're amazed that a couple of guys like this, 
a couple of uneducated Galilean fishermen are standing here before these people with potentially their lives or their freedom on the line. And with boldness, they are declaring the truth of the gospel. Observing their confidence, they understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. And they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. There was something about Peter and John and their confidence that led them to understand, oh, those are some of those followers of Jesus. We've seen this before. This is the confidence that we saw in Christ. And now this same thing is following with his disciples. In verse 14, And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. On this day, the chief priests and the elders and the rulers and the scribes, they gather Peter and John, a couple of untrained and uneducated Galilean fishermen. And the response that's given, the confidence that's exhibited, leaves these men speechless. So how do we, as the people of God, I mean, we're, we're not in the act situation. There's not a Sanhedrin that's going to probably convene or a group of elders and rulers that's going to come down on us for speaking in the name of Jesus. How do we uh, live out our circumstances, whatever those may be, uh, how do we live with this same confidence that Peter and John exhibited? I hope uh, that none of you are in danger of going to prison for your faith or really any other reason for that matter or that you're being persecuted as we see what's happening in the church in Afghanistan. But how does the American church who has so many resources and so much freedom and so many opportunities, how do we continue to live with this same kind of confidence although we may not be in pressure of, of going to prison or being heavily persecuted for our faith, how do we live out our days and face the circumstances that we have to face with the same sort of confidence that people might look at us and say, oh, oh yeah, I, I know what that is. That she must have been with Jesus. That must be a believer in Jesus Christ. I've seen people who have suffered like this before. And they can continue in their confidence and in their boldness and in their pursuit of Jesus. How do we do this? I want to take three lessons from Peter today on how he uh, maintained his confidence and ultimately what was the source of this confidence for him. Number one, um, Peter was confident in Christ. Now, it may seem like that's a really easy solution, uh, but for those of us who have been believers for very long, one of the things that happens to us is we begin to live out our faith in Jesus, we begin to live as disciples in this world, is we can kind of get caught um, gazing in the mirror too much. I don't know about you, uh, but if you've ever gone to share your faith with somebody, just to share the gospel, um, very quickly, my mind, my body, the, the enemy, whatever, begins to remind me of my own weakness, of my own inability, my inadequacy for the task. And so I start thinking, oh my gosh, Jason, you're so awkward, you know, you're a little overly intense, you don't, uh, you don't go easy at people, and they're like, oh my gosh, who is this guy, why is he accosting me with this message, or, you know, all of a sudden, all the excuses, all the weaknesses, all my past failures, all the ways I've ever done it wrong before, man, they just come back playing in my mind of, oh gosh, Jason, you're going to mess this up, you should probably just be quiet. And that's the temptation for us as believers in Jesus Christ. In the midst of our difficulty, whatever that may be, in the midst of opportunities to share the gospel, what, what our temptation will be is to focus on ourselves and our weaknesses and you can't do this and, you know, you've failed in the past. And yet for Peter, we know that his confidence was in Christ. Now, Peter had attempted this on his own before. Do y'all remember when, when Jesus told them, hey, um, I'm going to have to suffer and die. I'm actually you know, going to go to the cross. He wasn't being that explicit with it when he told them, but he's like, I'm going to be going away. And, and Peter's like, listen, even if I have to die, I will never deny you. As a matter of fact, Peter, this is his boldness, by the way. He must have been like a teenage boy at this point, right? Uh, even if every other person falls away, not me, Jesus. He was confident in himself. And yet, if you know the story of Peter, the last time he was around Caiaphas, he was in that courtyard as Jesus was being beaten inside. And there was a young slave girl there. In the first century, women didn't have much status. They were treated as second rate at best. So here's a little young slave girl, not even a grown woman, and she's a slave. So she's even lower on the social ladder. And Peter, 
who had declared that he would never deny Jesus Christ, that he would, even if every other person fell away, he wouldn't. Before this low-status slave girl, he denies even knowing Jesus three times. Peter had attempted to live out his faith in his own flesh. He had had confidence in himself before, and he had fallen flat. And yet on this day, after coming to faith in Jesus Christ, receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter stands firm and with bold confidence that was so profound that it amazed even the rulers and the elders. They were left speechless. Peter remained steadfast. He boldly declared the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this about you, and we need to hear this. It says this about us as followers of Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you have come to faith in Jesus, if you've come to know the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, if you have been saved by God, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. You are not your past you are not your weaknesses. You are not inadequate. Like That's not who you are. You are now in Christ. You are a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. So for us, living out our circumstances in the midst of this life, and yes, we do still have weakness of our flesh. It still was true of Peter and John. They were unlearned and unschooled, and yet they responded with this bold confidence on this, on this day because their confidence was in Christ. And so for us, I don't know what the circumstances might be. I don't know what you're going through in your life. I don't know what opportunities you're going to have to share the gospel tomorrow or next week or next year. But here's what I do know is that Jesus Christ has supplied everything that you need to be faithful. And that's not in yourself. It's not God has somehow built you up and made you some big, strong person that could do it all on your own. But rather, it's when we come to God in dependence upon Him, our confidence, not in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ and His power and His work that we remain steadfast. So number one, Peter was confident in Christ. Number two, Peter was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, it literally tells us here that Peter was unlearned and he was unschooled. This means he hadn't been to like the rabbinical schools like many of the scholars, the elders, the scribes, and the Pharisees who would have been there on this day. He didn't have the training that they had. He wasn't trained in rhetoric. He didn't have all the interpretive training of, for the Old Testament that they had. And yet, when it mattered most, it was the Holy Spirit of God who brought to mind to Peter Psalm 118. The fulfillment of the prophecy, the thing that every one of those trained interpreters, every one of those experts in the law, they missed it. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter saw it. He declares Psalm 118 about Jesus this man, this is a stone which the builders rejected. This is the chief cornerstone. That's who Jesus is. There's salvation in nobody else. No other name been given among men by which we must be saved. Y'all, that was revealed by the Holy Spirit of God, who in that moment, it tells us here in verse 8, that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, began to respond to them. So his confidence was not in himself, it was in Christ. Peter was empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk the path that God had marked out for him. Can I just say this to you once again? God has marked out a path for you. He has good works prepared in advance that he wants you to walk in. And he's given us of his Holy Spirit to empower us for every single step. Every single step. It's a step of dependence upon God. God, I can't, but you can. God, would you give me what I need for this moment, for this conversation, to walk through this difficulty? This, this morning, I didn't tell him I was going to do this. I hope he doesn't care. But we got to celebrate Wes Anderson. Uh, he spent a couple of weeks in ICU with COVID, and there were some difficult days. And we got to celebrate Wes being back here this morning. He's still a little weak. It's been a, a really difficult road for him. And yet it was God who brought him through every single step of that. Like in his difficult moments, it was God whom he clung to. It was the power of the Spirit that would give him encouragement when he needed encouragement. Well, Y'all, that's all we got, right? And yet the power of the Holy Spirit is profound. If it can make the lame man walk. It can give you the words to say, right? If the Holy Spirit can raise Jesus from the dead, what can he not do through us? 
So confidence for our circumstances. We're confident in Christ. We're empowered by the Spirit. And then the final piece here. Does Peter believe the truth of the gospel? Or us, in the American church, who we hear about suffering around the world. I heard a story this week of someone who was connected to a lady, a believer in Afghanistan. This week, she was martyred for her faith. I don't know any more details than that. In following after Jesus Christ, she remained steadfast in the end, and she died for her faith. And yet, here we are as American Christians, not to minimize the difficulty that we go through. We're not going through that. Um, but how do we continue to live with this boldness and confidence in the midst of our freedom, in the midst of our comfort, in the midst of all that God has given to us? Church, we have got to believe the truth of the gospel and not get distracted by all the other stuff. What if we really believed that there is salvation in no one else? That there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved? What if we really believe that for our friends and for our neighbors? I was at the lake with, with my family uh, yesterday and had a good time and I was just looking and there are boats and people and everyone just having a good time living their life. I was having a good time. I didn't get sunburned, but I, I too was having a, a good time. But as I look out there, I think, and I wonder if people know about the deeper and the greater reality that, that exists here. I wonder if they know the truth of the gospel that in the midst of all of our, our play and our, our busyness and all the stuff that we have, that this reality is like foundational to every other thing. That this life is like a breath. It's like a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. And, and at the end of this life, the only thing will matter is whose name they have claimed in this life. Have they come to know Jesus Christ and have faith in him? This life is is but a vapor, and eternity is forever. And Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He came and he lived a perfect, sinless life on this earth, and he went to the cross to die for their sins. Of the people that you're going to see here on, as we celebrate Labor Day together, the people that you're going to see in the grocery store, or the people you're going to pass on the road, Jesus Christ died, that they don't spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell, but they can spend eternity with him in heaven. They can have salvation for their souls rather than facing the judgment of God for their sin. They get to experience his love and his grace and his forgiveness and true life found in him. Church, we've got to believe the gospel and not like, oh, yeah, I believe it when I'm in church on Sunday, but every minute of every single day, we truly believe the gospel, that there is no other name given among men by which people must be saved, that unless we come to faith in Christ, we face judgment. And we want to play. We want to enjoy our families. God has been so good to us. So I don't want to say don't enjoy your Labor Day. You should, right? But at the same time, we live as people of purpose. And we live in light of eternity. We live in light of the truth of the gospel. So we live with confidence. And we don't shrink back from opportunities. And when we endure difficulty, whatever that might be, we can have hope in Jesus Christ because we know in this life it's just a short, short time. And then it's eternity in heaven with Jesus. So today I want to encourage you to be confident in who you are, not, not in your own weakness in your flesh, confident in who you are in Christ Jesus, confident that you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. God wants to use the donkey. He can use me, right? That's what we, we believe. We're empowered by the Spirit, and we are confident in the truth of the gospel. And so we go live as disciples of Jesus Christ. We offer ourselves to him, and our hope and our prayer is that someday, I don't know, 10, 20, 100, 1,000 years from now, that people will know the gospel more. That the gospel message would have spread more and more because he used people a lot like us. That some people might describe as unlearned and unschooled. Ordinary Galilean fishermen type people just like us. And he might use us to bring about life for them. To minister of the gospel. To be confident in the midst of difficulty. But ultimately glorifying God in the way that we live our lives. Would you bow with me?
Father, we thank you again uh, for your word, for the witness of early believers who lived it well. And God, we don't know that we'll ever have to face persecution like the church in Afghanistan or even like Peter and John. But Lord, if we should, I pray that we would have the same confidence in you. And God, if we get to live lives that are free and rather comfortable and, and, and rather easy, God, I pray all the more that we might boldly declare the gospel of Jesus Christ that we might believe the gospel with all of our hearts and in the power of the Holy Spirit and the confidence of Jesus Christ, we might declare. We might live lives for your glory. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.